For several days things went along in about the same course. I took our position every morning with my crude sextant, but the results were always most unsatisfactory. They always showed a considerable westing when I knew that we had been sailing due north. I blamed my crude instrument and kept on. Then one afternoon the girl came to me. Pardon me, she said, but were I you, I should watch this man Benson, especially when he is in charge. I asked her what she meant thinking I could see the influence of von Skunvorts raising a suspicion against one of my most trusted men. If you will note the boat's course a half hour after Benson goes on duty, she said, you will know what I mean, and you will understand why he prefers a night watch. Possibly, too, you will understand some other things that have taken place aboard. Then she went back to her room, thus ending the conversation. I waited until half an hour after Benson had gone on duty, and then I went on deck, passing through the conning tower where Benson sat, and looking at the compass. It showed that our course was north by west, that is, one point west of north, which was, for our assumed position, about right. I was greatly relieved to find that nothing was wrong, for the girl's words had caused me considerable apprehension. I was about to return to my room when a thought occurred to me that again caused me to change my mind and, incidentally, came near proving my death warrant. When I had left the conning tower little more than a half hour since, the sea had been breaking over the port bow, and it seemed to me quite improbable that in so short a time an equally heavy sea could be deluging us from the opposite side of the ship winds may change quickly, but not a long, heavy sea. There was only one other solution since I left the tower our course had been altered some eight points. Turning quickly, I climbed out upon the conning tower. A single glance at the heavens confirmed my suspicions, the constellations which should have been dead ahead were directly starboard. We were sailing due west. Just for an instant longer I stood there to check up my calculations, I wanted to be quite sure before I accused Benson of perfidy, and about the only thing I came near making quite sure of was death. I cannot see even now how I escaped it. I was standing on the edge of the conning tower, when a heavy palm suddenly struck me between the shoulders and hurled me forward into space. The drop to the triangular deck forward of the conning tower might easily have broken a leg for me, or I might have slipped off onto the deck and rolled overboard, but fate was upon my side, as I was only slightly bruised. As I came to my feet, I heard the conning tower cover slam. There is a ladder which leads from the deck to the top of the tower. Up this I scrambled, as fast as I could go, but Benson had the cover tight before I reached it. I stood there a moment in dumb consternation. What did the fellow intend? What was going on below? If Benson was a traitor, how could I know that there were not other traitors among us? I cursed myself for my folly in going out upon the deck, and then this thought suggested another, a hideous one, who was it that had really been responsible for my being here? Thinking to attract attention from inside the craft, I again ran down the ladder and onto the small deck only to find that the steel covers of the conning tower windows were shut, and then I leaned with my back against the tower and cursed myself for a gullible idiot. I glanced at the bow. The sea seemed to be getting heavier, for every wave now washed completely over the lower deck. I watched them for a moment, and then a sudden chill pervaded my entire being. It was not the chill of wet clothing, or the dashing spray which drenched my face, no, it was the chill of the hand of death upon my heart. In an instant I had turned the last corner of life's highway and was looking God Almighty in the face, the U-33 was being slowly submerged. It would be difficult, even impossible, to set down in writing my sensations at that moment. All I can particularly recall is that I laughed, though neither from a spirit of bravado nor from hysteria. And I wanted to smoke. Lord! How I did want to smoke, but that was out of the question. I watched the water rise until the little deck I stood on was awash, and then I clambered once more to the top of the conning tower. From the very slow submergence of the boat I knew that Benson was doing the entire trick alone, that he was merely permitting the diving tanks to fill and that the diving rudders were not in use. 
The throbbing of the engines ceased, and in its stead came the steady vibration of the electric motors. The water was halfway up the conning tower. I had perhaps five minutes longer on the deck. I tried to decide what I should do after I was washed away. Should I swim until exhaustion claimed me, or should I give up and end the agony at the first plunge? From below came two muffled reports. They sounded not unlike shots. Was Benson meeting with resistance? Personally it could mean little to me, for even though my men might overcome the enemy, none would know of my predicament until long after it was too late to succor me. The top of the conning tower was now awash. I clung to the wireless mast, while the great waves surged sometimes completely over me. I knew the end was near and, almost involuntarily, I did that which I had not done since childhood, I prayed. After that I felt better. I clung and waited, but the water rose no higher. Instead it receded. Now the top of the conning tower received only the crests of the higher waves, now the little triangular deck below became visible. What had occurred within? Did Benson believe me already gone, and was he emerging because of that belief, or had he and his forces been vanquished? The suspense was more wearing than that which I had endured while waiting for dissolution. Presently the main deck came into view, and then the conning tower opened behind me, and I turned to look into the anxious face of Bradley. An expression of relief overspread his features. Thank God, man, was all he said as he reached forth and dragged me into the tower. I was cold and numb and rather all in. Another few minutes would have done for me, I am sure, but the warmth of the interior helped to revive me, aided and abetted by some brandy which Bradley poured down my throat, from which had nearly removed the membrane. That brandy would have revived a corpse. When I got down into the central, I saw the Germans lined up on one side with a couple of my men with pistols standing over them. Von Schoonbortz was among them. On the floor lay Benson, moaning, and beyond him stood the girl, a revolver in one hand. I looked about, bewildered. What has happened down here? I asked. Tell me. Bradley replied. You see the result, sir, he said. It might have been a very different result but for Miss LaRue. We were all asleep. Benson had relieved the guard early in the evening, there was no one to watch him, no one but Miss LaRue. She felt the submergence of the boat and came out of her room to investigate. She was just in time to see Benson at the diving rudders. When he saw her, he raised his pistol and fired point-blank at her but he missed and she fired and didn't miss. The two shots awakened everyone, and as our men were armed, the result was inevitable as you see it, but it would have been very different had it not been for Miss LaRue. It was she who closed the diving tank seacocks and roused Olsen and me, and had the pumps started to empty them. And there I had been thinking that through her machinations I had been lured to the deck and to my death. I could have gone on my knees to her and begged her forgiveness, or at least I could have, had I not been Anglo-Saxon. As it was, I could only remove my soggy cap and bow and mumble my appreciation. She made no reply, only turned and walked very rapidly toward her room. Could I have heard her right? Was it really a sob that came floating back to me through the narrow aisle of the U-33? Benson died that night. He remained defiant almost to the last, but just before he went out, he motioned to me, and I leaned over to catch the faintly whispered words. I did it alone, he said. I did it because I hate you, I hate all your kind. I was kicked out of your shipyard at Santa Monica. I was locked out of California. I am an I.W.W. I became a German agent, not because I love them for I hate them too, but because I wanted to injure Americans, whom I hated more. I threw the wireless apparatus overboard. I destroyed the chronometer and the sextant. I devised a scheme for varying the compass to suit my wishes. I told Wilson that I had seen the girl talking with von Schoonvorts, 
and I made the poor egg think he had seen her doing the same thing. I am sorry, sorry that my plans failed. I hate you. He didn't die for a half hour after that, nor did he speak again, aloud, but just a few seconds before he went to meet his maker, his lips moved in a faint whisper, and as I leaned closer to catch his words, what do you suppose I heard? Now I lay me down to sleep, that was all, Benson was dead. We threw his body overboard. The wind of that night brought on some pretty rough weather with a lot of black clouds which persisted for several days. We didn't know what course we had been holding, and there was no way of finding out, as we could no longer trust the compass, not knowing what Benson had done to it. The long and the short of it was that we cruised about aimlessly until the sun came out again. I'll never forget that day or its surprises. We reckoned, or rather guessed, that we were somewhere off the coast of Peru. The wind, which had been blowing fitfully from the east, suddenly veered around into the south, and presently we felt a sudden chill. Peru, snorted Olson. When were yes after smellin' iceberg RGS off Peru? Icebergs. Icebergs, nothing, exclaimed one of the Englishmen. Why, man, they don't come north of 14 here in these waters. Then, replied Olson, Yuri south of 14, need be why. We thought he was crazy, but he wasn't, for that afternoon we sighted a great berg south of us, and we'd been running north, we thought, four days. I can tell you we were a discouraged lot, but we got a faint thrill of hope early the next morning when the lookout ball down the open hatch, land. Land northwest by west. I think we were all sick for the sight of land. I know that I was, but my interest was quickly dissipated by the sudden illness of three of the Germans. Almost simultaneously they commenced vomiting. They couldn't suggest any explanation for it. I asked them what they had eaten, and found they had eaten nothing other than the food cooked for all of us. Have you drunk anything? I asked, for I knew that there was liquor aboard, and medicines in the same locker. Only water, moaned one of them. We all drank water together this morning. We opened a new tank. Maybe it was the water. I started an investigation which revealed a terrifying condition. Someone, probably Benson, had poisoned all the running water on the ship. It would have been worse, though, had land not been in sight. The sight of land filled us with renewed hope. Our course had been altered, and we were rapidly approaching what appeared to be a precipitous headland. Cliffs, seemingly rising perpendicularly out of the sea, faded away into the mist upon either hand as we approached. The land before us might have been a continent, so mighty appeared the shoreline, yet we knew that we must be thousands of miles from the nearest western landmass, New Zealand or Australia. We took our bearings with our crude and inaccurate instruments, we searched the chart, we cudgeled our brains, and at last it was Bradley who suggested a solution. He was in the tower and watching the compass, to which he called my attention. The needle was pointing straight toward the land. Bradley swung the helm hard to starboard. I could feel the U-33 respond, and yet the arrow still clung straight and sure toward the distant cliffs. What do you make of it? I asked him. Did you ever hear of Caproni? he asked. An early Italian navigator? I returned. Yes, he followed Cook about 1721. He is scarcely mentioned even by contemporaneous historians, probably because he got into political difficulties on his return to Italy. It was the fashion to scoff at his claims, but I recall reading one of his works, his only one, I believe, in which he described a new continent in the South Seas, a continent made up of a some strange metal which attracted the compass, a rock-bound, inhospitable coast, without beach or harbor, which extended for hundreds of miles. He could make no landing, nor in the several days he cruised about it did he see sign of life. He called it Caprona and sailed away. I believe, sir, that we are looking upon the coast of Caprona, uncharted and forgotten for two hundred years. 
If you are right, it might account for much of the deviation of the compass during the past two days, I suggested. Caprona has been luring us upon her deadly rocks. Well, we'll accept her challenge. We'll land upon Caprona. Along that long front there must be a vulnerable spot. We will find it, Bradley, for we must find it. We must find water on Caprona, or we must die. And so we approached the coast upon which no living ice had ever rested. Straight from the ocean's depths rose towering cliffs, shot with brown and blues and greens, withered moss and lichen and the verdigris of copper, and everywhere the rusty ochre of iron parietes. The clifftops, though ragged, were of such uniform height as to suggest the boundaries of a great plateau, and now and again we caught glimpses of verdure topping the rocky escarpment, as though bush or jungle land had pushed outward from a lush vegetation farther inland to signal to an unseeing world that Caprona lived and joyed in life beyond her austere and repellent coast. But metaphor, however poetic, never slaked a dry throat. To enjoy Caprona's romantic suggestions we must have water, and so we came in close, always sounding, and skirted the shore. As close in as we dared cruise, we found fathomless depths, and always the same undented coastline of bald cliffs. As darkness threatened, we drew away and lay well off the coast all night. We had not as yet really commenced to suffer for lack of water, but I knew that it would not be long before we did, and so at the first streak of dawn I moved in again and once more took up the hopeless survey of the forbidding coast. Toward noon we discovered a beach, the first we had seen. It was a narrow strip of sand at the base of a part of the cliff that seemed lower than any we had before scanned. At its foot, half buried in the sand, lay great boulders, mute evidence that in a bygone age some mighty natural force had crumpled Caprona's barrier at this point. It was Bradley who first called our attention to a strange object lying among the boulders above the surf. Looks like a man, he said, and passed his glasses to me. I looked long and carefully and could have sworn that the thing I saw was the sprawled figure of a human being. Miss LaRue was on deck with us. I turned and asked her to go below. Without a word she did as I bade. Then I stripped, and as I did so, Nobbs looked questioningly at me. He had been wanted home to enter the surf with me, and evidently he had not forgotten it. What are you going to do, sir? asked Olson. I'm going to see what that thing is on shore, I replied. If it's a man, it may mean that Caprona is inhabited, or it may merely mean that some poor devils were shipwrecked here. I ought to be able to tell from the clothing which is more near the truth. How about sharks? queried Olson. Sure, you ought to carry a knife. Here you are, sir, cried one of the men. It was a long slim blade he offered, one that I could carry between my teeth, and so I accepted it gladly. Keep close in, I directed Bradley, and then I dived over the side and struck out for the narrow beach. There was another splash directly behind me, and turning my head, I saw faithful old Nob swimming valiantly in my wake. The surf was not heavy, and there was no undertow, so we made shore easily, affecting an equally easy landing. The beach was composed largely of small stones worn smooth by the action of water. There was little sand, though from the deck of the U-33 the beach had appeared to be all sand, and I saw no evidences of mollusca or crustacea such as are common to all beaches I have previously seen. I attribute this to the fact of the smallness of the beach, the enormous depth of surrounding water and the great distance at which Caprona lies from her nearest neighbor. As Nobbs and I approached the recumbent figure farther up the beach, I was appraised by my nose that whether man or not, the thing had once been organic and alive, but that for some time it had been dead. Nobbs halted, sniffed, and growled. A little later he sat down upon his haunches, raised his muzzle to the heavens and bade forth a most dismal howl. I shot a small stone at him and bade him shut up, his uncanny noise made me nervous. When I had come quite close to the thing, I still could not say whether it had been man or beast. The carcass was badly swollen and partly decomposed. There was no sign of clothing upon or about it. 
A fine, brownish hair covered the chest and abdomen, and the face, the palms of the hands, the feet, the shoulders and back were practically hairless. The creature must have been about the height of a fair-sized man, its features were similar to those of a man, yet had it been a man? I could not say, for it resembled an ape no more than it did a man. Its large toes protruded laterally as do those of the semi-arboreal peoples of Borneo, the Philippines and other remote regions where low types still persist. The countenance might have been that of a cross between Pithecanthropus, the Java ape man, and the daughter of the Piltdown race of prehistoric Sussex. A wooden cudgel lay beside the corpse. Now this fact set me thinking. There was no wood of any description in sight. There was nothing about the beach to suggest a wrecked mariner. There was absolutely nothing about the body to suggest that it might possibly in life have known a maritime experience. It was the body of a low type of man or a high type of beast. In neither instance would it have been of a seafaring race. Therefore I deduced that it was native to Caprona, that it lived inland, and that it had fallen or been hurled from the cliffs above. Such being the case, Caprona was inhabitable, if not inhabited, by man, but how to reach the inhabitable interior? That was the question. A closer view of the cliffs than had been afforded me from the deck of the U-33 only confirmed my conviction that no mortal man could scale those perpendicular heights, there was not a fingerhold, not a toehold, upon them. I turned away baffled. Nobs and I met with no sharks upon our return journey to the submarine. My report filled everyone with theories and speculations, and with renewed hope and determination. They all reasoned along the same lines that I had reasoned, the conclusions were obvious, but not the water. We were now thirstier than ever. The balance of that day we spent in continuing a minute and fruitless exploration of the monotonous coast. There was not another break in the frowning cliffs, not even another minute patch of pebbly beach. As the sun fell, so did our spirits. I had tried to make advances to the girl again, but she would have none of me, and so I was not only thirsty but otherwise sad and downhearted. I was glad when the new day broke the hideous spell of a sleepless night. The morning's search brought us no shred of hope. Caprona was impregnable, that was the decision of all, yet we kept on. It must have been about two bells of the afternoon watch that Bradley called my attention to the branch of a tree, with leaves upon it, floating on the sea. It may have been carried down to the ocean by a river, he suggested. Yes, I replied, it may have, it may have tumbled or been thrown off the top of one of these cliffs. Bradley's face fell. I thought of that, too, he replied, but I wanted to believe the other. Right you are. I cried. We must believe the other until we prove it false. We can't afford to give up heart now, when we need heart most. The branch was carried down by a river, and we are going to find that river. I smote my open palm with a clenched fist, to emphasize a determination unsupported by hope. There! I cried suddenly. See that, Bradley? and I pointed at a spot closer to shore. See that, man. Some flowers and grasses and another leafy branch floated toward us. We both scanned the water and the coastline. Bradley evidently discovered something, or at least thought that he had. He called down for a bucket and a rope, and when they were passed up to him, he lowered the former into the sea and drew it in filled with water. Of this he took a taste, and straightening up, looked into my eyes with an expression of elation, as much as to say, I told you so. This water is warm, he announced, and fresh. I grabbed the bucket and tasted its contents. The water was very warm, and it was fresh, but there was a most unpleasant taste to it. Did you ever taste water from a stagnant pool full of tadpoles? Bradley asked. That's it, I exclaimed, that's just the taste exactly, though I haven't experienced it since boyhood, but how can water from a flowing stream taste thus, and what the dickens makes it so warm? 
it must be at least 70 or 80 Fahrenheit, possibly higher. Yes, agreed Bradley, I should say higher, but where does it come from? That is easily discovered now that we have found it, I answered. It can't come from the ocean, so it must come from the land. All that we have to do is follow it, and sooner or later we shall come upon its source. We were already rather close in, but I ordered the U-33's prow turned inshore and we crept slowly along, constantly dipping up the water and tasting it to assure ourselves that we didn't get outside the fresh water current. There was a very light offshore wind and scarcely any breakers, so that the approach to the shore was continued without finding bottom, yet though we were already quite close, we saw no indication of any indention in the coast from which even a tiny brooklet might issue and certainly no mouth of a large river such as this must necessarily be to freshen the ocean even two hundred yards from shore. The tide was running out, and this, together with the strong flow of the freshwater current, would have prevented our going against the cliffs even had we not been under power, as it was we had to buck the combined forces in order to hold our position at all. We came up to within twenty-five feet of the sheer wall, which loomed high above us. There was no break in its forbidding face. As we watched the face of the waters and searched the cliff's high face, Olsen suggested that the fresh water might come from a submarine geyser. This, he said, would account for its heat, but even as he spoke a bush, covered thickly with leaves and flowers, bubbled to the surface and floated off astern. Flowering shrubs don't thrive in the subterranean caverns from which geysers spring, suggested Bradley. Olsen shook his head. It beats me, he said. I've got it. I exclaimed suddenly. Look there. And I pointed at the base of the cliff ahead of us, which the receding tide was gradually exposing to our view. They all looked, and all saw what I had seen, the top of a dark opening in the rock, through which water was pouring out into the sea. It's the subterranean channel of an inland river, I cried. It flows through a land covered with vegetation, and therefore a land upon which the sun shines. No subterranean caverns produce any order of plant life even remotely resembling what we have seen disgorged by this river. Beyond those cliffs lay fertile lands and fresh water, perhaps, game. Ease, sir, said Olson, behind the cliffs. Ye spoke a true word, sir, behind. Bradley laughed, a rather sorry laugh, though. You might as well call our attention to the fact, sir, he said, that science has indicated that there is fresh water and vegetation on Mars. Not at all, I rejoined. A U-boat isn't constructed to navigate space, but it is designed to travel below the surface of the water. You'd be after sailing into that blank pocket, asked Olson. I would, Olson, I replied. We haven't one chance for life in a hundred thousand if we don't find food and water upon Caprona. This water coming out of the cliff is not salt, but neither is it fit to drink, though each of us has drunk. It is fair to assume that inland the river is fed by pure streams, that there are fruits and herbs and game. Shall we lie out here and die of thirst and starvation with a land of plenty possibly only a few hundred yards away? We have the means for navigating a subterranean river. Are we too cowardly to utilize this means? Be after going to it, said Olson. I'm willing to see it through, agreed Bradley. Then under the bottom, why the best o' luck can give em hell, cried a young fellow who had been in the trenches. To the diving stations. I commanded, and in less than a minute the deck was deserted, the conning tower covers had slammed to and the U-33 was submerging, possibly for the last time. I know that I had this feeling, and I think that most of the others did. As we went down, I sat in the tower with the searchlight projecting its seemingly feeble rays ahead. We submerged very slowly and without headway more than sufficient to keep her nose in the right direction and as we went down, I saw outlined ahead of us the black opening in the great cliff. 
It was an opening that would have admitted a half dozen U-boats at one and the same time, roughly cylindrical in contour and dark as the pit of perdition. As I gave the command which sent the U-33 slowly ahead, I could not but feel a certain uncanny presentiment of evil. Where were we going? What lay at the end of this great sewer? Had we bidden farewell forever to the sunlight and life, or were there before us dangers even greater than those which we now faced? I tried to keep my mind from vain imagining by calling everything which I observed to the eager ears below. I was the eyes of the whole company, and I did my best not to fail them. We had advanced a hundred yards, perhaps, when our first danger confronted us. Just ahead was a sharp right angle turn in the tunnel. I could see the river's flotsam hurtling against the rocky wall upon the left as it was driven on by the mighty current, and I feared for the safety of the U-33 in making so sharp a turn under such adverse conditions, but there was nothing for it but to try. I didn't warn my fellows of the danger it could have but caused them useless apprehension, for if we were to be smashed against the rocky wall, no power on earth could avert the quick end that would come to us. I gave the command full speed ahead and went charging toward the menace. I was forced to approach the dangerous left-hand wall in order to make the turn, and I depended upon the power of the motors to carry us through the surging waters in safety. Well, we made it, but it was a narrow squeak. As we swung around, the full force of the current caught us and drove the stern against the rocks, there was a thud which sent a tremor through the whole craft, and then a moment of nasty grinding as the steel hull scraped the rock wall. I expected momentarily the inrush of waters that would seal our doom, but presently from below came the welcome word that all was well. In another fifty yards there was a second turn, this time toward the left. But it was more of a gentle curve, and we took it without trouble. After that it was plain sailing, though as far as I could know, there might be most anything ahead of us, and my nerves strained to the snapping point every instant. After the second turn the channel ran comparatively straight for between 150 and 200 yards. The waters grew suddenly lighter, and my spirits rose accordingly. I shouted down to those below that I saw daylight ahead, and a great shout of thanksgiving reverberated through the ship. A moment later we emerged into sunlit water, and immediately I raised the periscope and looked about me upon the strangest landscape I had ever seen. We were in the middle of a broad and now sluggish river the banks of which were lined by giant, arboraceous ferns, raising their mighty fronds fifty, one hundred, two hundred feet into the quiet air. Close by us something rose to the surface of the river and dashed at the periscope. I had a vision of wide, distended jaws, and then all was blotted out. A shiver ran down into the tower as the thing closed upon the periscope. A moment later it was gone, and I could see again. Above the trees there soared into my vision a huge thing on bat-like wings, a creature large as a large whale, but fashioned more after the order of a lizard. Then again something charged the periscope and blotted out the mirror. I will confess that I was almost gasping for breath as I gave the commands to emerge. Into what sort of strange land had fate guided us? The instant the deck was awash, I opened the conning tower hatch and stepped out. In another minute the deck hatch lifted, and those who were not on duty below streamed up the ladder, Olsen bringing knobs under one arm. For several minutes no one spoke, I think they must each have been as overcome by awe as was I. All about us was a flora and fauna as strange and wonderful to us as might have been those upon a distant planet had we suddenly been miraculously transported through ether to an unknown world. Even the grass upon the nearer bank was unearthly, lush and high it grew and each blade bore upon its tip a brilliant flower, violet or yellow or carmine or blue, making as gorgeous a sward as human imagination might conceive. But the life. It teemed. The tall, fern-like trees were alive with monkeys, snakes, and lizards. Huge insects hummed and buzzed hither and thither. Mighty forms could be seen moving upon the ground in the thick forest, while the bosom of the river wriggled with living things, and above flapped the wings of gigantic creatures such as we are taught have been extinct throughout countless ages. Look, cried Olson. Would you look at the giraffe coming up out o' oh, the bottom of the say? 
We looked in the direction he pointed and saw a long, glossy neck surmounted by a small head rising above the surface of the river. Presently the back of the creature was exposed, brown and glossy as the water dripped from it. It turned its eyes upon us, opened its lizard-like mouth, emitted a shrill hiss and came for us. The thing must have been sixteen or eighteen feet in length and closely resembled pictures I had seen of restored plesiosaurs of the lower Jurassic. It charged us as savagely as a mad bull, and one would have thought it intended to destroy and devour the mighty U-boat, as I verily believe it did intend. We were moving slowly up the river as the creature bore down upon us with distended jaws. The long neck was far outstretched, and the four flippers with which it swam were working with powerful strokes, carrying it forward at a rapid pace. When it reached the craft's side, the jaws closed upon one of the stanchions of the deck rail and tore it from its socket as though it had been a toothpick stuck in putty. At this exhibition of titanic strength I think we all simultaneously stepped backward, and Bradley drew his revolver and fired. The bullet struck the thing in the neck, just above its body, but instead of disabling it, nearly increased its rage. Its hissing rose to a shrill scream as it raised half its body out of water onto the sloping sides of the hull of the U-33 and endeavored to scramble upon the deck to devour us. A dozen shots rang out as we who were armed drew our pistols and fired at the thing, but though struck several times, it showed no signs of succumbing and only floundered farther aboard the submarine. I had noticed that the girl had come on deck and was standing not far behind me, and when I saw the danger to which we were all exposed, I turned and forced her toward the hatch. We had not spoken for some days, and we did not speak now, but she gave me a disdainful look, which was quite as eloquent as words, and broke loose from my grasp. I saw I could do nothing with her unless I exerted force, and so I turned with my back toward her that I might be in a position to shield her from the strange reptile should it really succeed in reaching the deck, and as I did so I saw the thing raise one flipper over the rail, dart its head forward and with the quickness of lightning seize upon one of the botches. I ran forward, discharging my pistol into the creature's body in an effort to force it to relinquish its prey, but I might as profitably have shot at the sun. Shrieking and screaming, the German was dragged from the deck, and the moment the reptile was clear of the boat, it dived beneath the surface of the water with its terrified prey. I think we were all more or less shaken by the frightfulness of the tragedy until Olsen remarked that the balance of power now rested where it belonged. Following the death of Benson we had been nine and nine, nine Germans and nine allies, as we called ourselves, now there were but eight Germans. We never counted the girl on either side, I suppose because she was a girl, though we knew well enough now that she was ours. And so Olsen's remark helped to clear the atmosphere for the allies at least, and then our attention was once more directed toward the river, for around us there had sprung up a perfect bedlam of screams and hisses and a seething cauldron of hideous reptiles, devoid of fear and filled only with hunger and with rage. They clambered, squirmed and wriggled to the deck, forcing us steadily backward, though we emptied our pistols into them. There were all sorts and conditions of horrible things, huge, hideous, grotesque, monstrous, a veritable Mesozoic nightmare. I saw that the girl was gotten below as quickly as possible, and she took Nobs with her, poor Nobs had nearly barked his head off, and I think, too, that for the first time since his littlest puppyhood he had known fear, nor can I blame him. After the girl I sent Bradley and most of the allies and then the Germans who were on deck, von Schoonvorts being still in irons below. The creatures were approaching perilously close before I dropped through the hatchway and slammed down the cover. Then I went into the tower and ordered full speed ahead, hoping to distance the fearsome things, but it was useless. Not only could any of them easily outdistance the U-33, but the further upstream we progressed the greater the number of our besiegers, until fearful of navigating a strange river at high speed, I gave orders to reduce and move slowly and majestically through the plunging, hissing mass. I was mighty glad that our entrance into the interior of Caprona had been inside a submarine rather than in any other form of vessel. I could readily understand how it might have been that Caprona had been invaded in the past by venturesome navigators without word of it ever reaching the outside world, for I can assure you that only by submarine could man pass up that great sluggish river, alive. We proceeded up the river for some forty miles before darkness overtook us. 
I was afraid to submerge and lie on the bottom overnight for fear that the mud might be deep enough to hold us, and as we could not hold with the anchor, I ran in close to shore, and in a brief interim of attack from the reptiles we made fast to a large tree. We also dipped up some of the river water and found it, though quite warm, a little sweeter than before. We had food enough, and with the water we were all quite refreshed, but we missed fresh meat. It had been weeks, now, since we had tasted it, and the sight of the reptiles gave me an idea that a steak or two from one of them might not be bad eating. So I went on deck with a rifle, twenty of which were aboard the U-33. At sight of me a huge thing charged and climbed to the deck. I retreated to the top of the conning tower, and when it had raised its mighty bulk to the level of the little deck on which I stood, I let it have a bullet right between the eyes. The thing stopped then and looked at me a moment as much as to say, why this thing has a stinger? I must be careful. And then it reached out its long neck and opened its mighty jaws and grabbed for me, but I wasn't there. I had tumbled backward into the tower, and I mighty near killed myself doing it. When I glanced up, that little head on the end of its long neck was coming straight down on top of me, and once more I tumbled into greater safety, sprawling upon the floor of the central. Olsen was looking up, and seeing what was poking about in the tower, ran for an axe, nor did he hesitate a moment when he returned with one, but sprang up the ladder and commenced chopping away at that hideous face. The thing didn't have sufficient brain pan to entertain more than a single idea at once. Though chopped and hacked, and with a bullet hole between its eyes, it still persisted madly in its attempt to get inside the tower and devour Olsen, though its body was many times the diameter of the hatch, nor did it cease its efforts until after Olsen had succeeded in decapitating it. Then the two men went on deck through the main hatch, and while one kept watch, the other cut a hind quarter off Plesiosaurus Elsoni, as Bradley dubbed the thing. Meantime Olsen cut off the long neck, saying that it would make fine soup. By the time we had cleared away the blood and refuse in the tower, the cook had juicy steaks and a steaming broth upon the electric stove, and the aroma arising from P. Elsoni filled us all with a hitherto unfelt admiration for him and all his kind.